the giraffe by H. A. Bryden. Giraffes, which are found only in the continent of Africa, are the tallest of all living creatures. They belong to the ruminants, or cud chewers, and naturalists are inclined to place them somewhere between the deer family and the hollow horned ruminants, in which latter are found to be oxen, buffaloes, and antelopes. Rudemeyer, the Swiss naturalist, once defined them as a most fantastic form of deer, which is, perhaps, as good a definition of them as one is likely to hit upon. Fossil discoveries show that in ages long remote, great giraffe-like creatures, some of them bearing horns or antlers, roamed widely in the south of Europe, Persia, India, and even China. Of living giraffes, two species have thus far been identified southern or Cape Giraffe, with a range extending from Cochuneland and Transvaal to British East Africa and the Sudan, and the Nubian or Northern Giraffe found chiefly in East Africa, Somaliland, and the country between Abyssinia and the Nile. The Southern Giraffe, which from its recent appearance in the gardens of the Zoological Society, is now the more familiar of the two animals has a creamy or yellowish white ground color, marked by irregular blotches which vary in color, in animals of different ages from lemon fawn to orange tawny, and in older specimens to a very dark chestnut. Old bulls and occasionally old cows grow extremely dark with age and at a distance appear almost black upon the back and shoulders. The northern giraffe is widely different coloration being usually a rich red chestnut, darker with age, separated by a fine network of white lines, symmetrically arranged in poly polygonal patterns. At no great distance, this giraffe, instead of having the blotchy or dappled appearance of the southern giraffe, looks almost entirely chestnut in color. Again, the southern giraffe has only two horns, while the northern species usually develops a third growing from the center of the forehead. These horns, which are covered with hair in both species and tufted black at the tips, are in the youthful days of the animal, actually separable from the bones of the head. As the animal arrives at maturity, they become firmly united to the skull. A third race or subspecies of giraffe has been identified in Western Africa, mainly from the skull and cannon bones of a specimen shot in 1897 at the junction of the Banu and Niger rivers, but very little is known about this form. Other varieties or subspecies may yet be discovered in other parts of the dark, dark continent. It is lacking in the giraffe's long neck. The towering height of the giraffe is entirely attributable to the great length of the neck and limbs. A full-grown bull giraffe will certainly measure occasionally as much as 19 feet in height. I measured very carefully a specimen shot by my hunting friend, Mr. W. Dove, in the forests of the northern Kalahari, South Africa, which taped 18 feet, 11 and a half inches. A fine cow shot by myself in the same country measured 16 feet, 10 inches, and there is no reason to suppose that cow giraffes do not easily reach fully 17 feet in height. These animals feed almost entirely upon the leaves of acacia trees, the foliage of the camille d'orne or giraffe acacia, affording their most favorite food supply. It is a most beautiful spectacle to see, as I have seen a large troop of these dappled giants, creatures which somehow viewed in the wild state always seem to me to belong to another epoch, quietly browsing with upstretched necks and delicate heads among the branches of the spreading mokala as the bakunas call this tree. The giraffe's upper lip is long and prehensile and covered no doubt as a protection against thorns with a thick velvety coating of short hair. The tongue is long, some 18 inches in length, and is employed for plucking down the tender leafage on which the giraffe feeds. The eyes of the giraffe are most beautiful, dark brown, shaded by long lashes, peculiar, tender, and melting in expression. Singularly enough, the animal is absolutely mute and never, even in its death agonies, utters a sound. The hoofs are large, elongate nearly 12 inches in length, 
in the case of old bulls, and look like those of a gigantic cattle. There are no false hooves, and the fetlock is round and smooth. The skin of a full-grown giraffe is extraordinarily tough and solid, attaining in the case of old males as much as an inch in thickness. From these animals, most of the shamboks, or colonial whips, in use all over South Africa, are now made, and it is a miserable fact to record that giraffes are now slaughtered by native and boar hunters almost solely for the value of the hide, which is worth from three euro to five euro in the case of full-grown beasts. So perishes the giraffe from South Africa. Giraffes live mainly in forest country, or country partially open and partially clothed with thin park-like stretches of low acacia trees. When pursued, they betake themselves to the densest parts of the bush and timber, and their thick hides being absolutely impervious to the frightful thorns with, with which all African jungle and forest seem to be provided, burst through every bushy obstacle with the greatest ease. They steer also in the most wonderful manner through the timber, nutting branches and evading tree boles with marvelous facility. I shall never forget seeing my hunting comrade after his first chase in thick bush. We had ridden as we always rode hunting in our flannel shirts, coatless. Attracted by his firing, I came with my friend who was sitting on the body of a huge old bull giraffe which had fallen dead in a grassy clearing. He was looking ruefully at the remains of his shirt which hung about him, literally in rags and ribbons. Blood was streaming from innumerable wounds upon his chest, neck, and arms. Always after that, we dorned cord coats when running giraffes in bush and forest country. In regions where they have been little disturbed, giraffes no doubt wander across open plains and are sure to be seen well away from the denser forests, eating among scattered islets of acacias easily exposed to the human eye. But in South Africa, they are now seldom to be met without the forest region. Once and once only, have I seen giraffes in the open. This was on the outskirts of the forest, and the great creatures had been tempted to a little knoll of macaula trees, rising from an islet from the sea of grass. One's first impression of these creatures in the wild state is very deceptive. I well remember first setting eyes upon a troop of five or six. As they swung away from the leafage on which they were feeding, my friend and I cantered easily, thinking that we should soon come up with them. We were completely deceived. With those immense legs of theirs, the great creatures going with their easy shuffling, but marvelously swift walk, were simply striding away from us. Discovering our mistake, we rode hard, and the giraffes then broke into their strange rocking gallop, and a headlong, desperate chase began to be terminated by the death of a fine cow. Like the camel, the giraffe progresses by moving the two legs upon either side of the body simultaneously. At this strange rocking gallop, these animals move at a great pace, and a good cape horse is needed to run into them. By far the best plan, if you are bent on shooting these animals, is to press your pony so soon as you see giraffes to the top of its speed and force the game beyond its natural paces in one desperate gallop of a mile or so. If well mounted, your nag will take you right up to the heels of the tall beasts and firing from the saddle, you can, without great difficulty, bring down the game. The giraffe, unlike the antelopes of Africa, is not very tenacious of life, and a bullet planted near the root of the tail will, penetrating the short body, pierce a vital spot and bring down the tall beasts crashing to the earth. Having tasted the delights of fox hunting and many other forms of sport, I can testify that the run-up to a good troop of giraffes is one of the most thrilling and exciting of all human experiences. There is nothing else quite like it in the wide range of sporting emotions. Having enjoyed this thrilling pleasure a few times, however, the humane hunter will stay his hand and shoot only when meat or perhaps an exceptionally fine specimen is absolutely needed. Giraffes are, of course, utterly defenseless and save for their shy, wary habits and remote, waterless habit, have nothing to shield them from the mounted hunter. Giraffe hunting on foot is a very different ma matter. In that case, the giraffe has the better of it, and the stalker is placed at great disadvantage. 
These animals are in many places found in extremely waterless country, where even the mounted hunter has much trouble to reach them. Like elands and gemsbok and other desert-loving antelopes, they can exist for long periods, months together, without drinking. In the northern portions of the Kalahari Desert, where I have carefully observed their habits, as well as hunted them, it is an undoubted fact that giraffes never touch water during the whole of the dry winter season, for several months on end. Gemsbok and elands, in the same waterless tract of the country, are complete abstainers for the same period. The flesh of the giraffe cow, if fairly young, is excellent, tender, and well-tasted with the flavor of game-like veal. The marrow bones also roasted over a gentle wood fire and sawn in half for delicious eating quite of the supreme delicacies of the African wilderness. The Okapi by Sir Henry Johnston, KCB, FCS. Readers of the living animals of the world probability readers of newspapers, and it would therefore be a affectation on the part of the writer of these lines, who assume that they have not heard more or less of the discovery, which he has privileged to make, of an entirely new ruminant of a large size, dwelling in the forest, bordering the Semliki River in Central Africa, on the borderland between the Uganda Protectorate and the Congo Free State. The history of this discovery stated briefly is as follows. In 1882 to 83, I was the guest of Mr. Now Sir Henry Stanley on the River Congo at the Stanley Pool. I was visiting the Congo at the time as an explorer in a very small way and a naturalist, Mr. Stanley, conversing with me on the possibility of African discoveries, told me then that he believed that all that was most wonderful in the tropic Africa would be found to be concentrated in the region of the Blue Mountains, south of the Albert Nyanza. This feeling on Stanley's part, doubtless, was one of the most reasons which urged him to go to re the relief of Iman Pasha. His journey through the great Congo forest towards the Blue Mountains of the Albert Nyanza resulted in his discovery of the greatest snow mountain range of Africa, Ruwenzori, and the river Simliki, which is the upper Albertine Nile of Lake Albert Edward, from which it flows round the flanks of Ruwenzori, and amongst other things, in more detailed information regarding the dwarf races of the northern Congo forest than we had yet received. Stanley also was the first to draw to the attention of the world the dense an awful character of these mighty woods, and to hint at the mysteries and wonders in natural history which they possibly contained. The stress and trouble of his expedition prevented him and his companions from bestowing much attention on natural history. Moreover, in these forests, it is extremely difficult for persons who are passing hurriedly through the tangle to come into actual contact with the beasts that inhabit them. Sir Henry Stanley, discussing this subject with me since my return from Uganda, tells me that he believes that the Okapi is only one amongst several strange new beasts which will eventually be discovered in these remarkable forests. He describes having seen a creature like a gigantic pig six feet in length and certain antelopes unlike any known type. In regard to the Okapi, the hint of its existence which he obtained was the announcement that the dwarfs knew of the existence of a creature in their forest, which greatly resembled an ass in appearance, and which they caught in pits. This tiny sentence in an appendix to his book, In Darkest Africa, attracted my attention some time before I went to Uganda. It seemed to me so extraordinary that any creature like a horse should inhabit a dense forest that I determined. If ever fate should lead me in that direction, I would make inquiries. Soon after reaching the Uganda Protectorate at the end of 1899, I came in contact with a large party of dwarfs who had been kidnapped by a too enterprising German impresario who had decided to show them at the Paris exhibition. As the Belgians objected to this procedure, I released the dwarfs from their kidnapper and retained them with me for some months in Uganda until I was able personally to escort them back to their homes in the Congo forest. I had other reasons connected with my government business for visiting the northwestern part of the Congo Free State. 
As soon as I could make the dwarfs understand me by means of an interpreter, I questioned them regarding the existence of this horse-like creature in their forest. They at once understood what I meant, and pointing to a zebra skin and a live mule, they informed me that the creature in question, which was called Okapi, was like a mule with zebra stripes on it. When I reached Fort Mbeni in the Congo Free State, on the west bank of the river Simliki, I put questions to the Belgian officers stationed there. They all knew the Okapi at any rate when dead. As a living animal, they had none of them seen it, but their native soldiers were in the habitat of hunting the animal in the forest and killing it with spears, and then bringing in the skin and the flesh for use in the fort. One of the officers declared that there was even a, then a freshly obtained skin lying about in the precincts of the fort. On searching for this, however, it was discovered that the greater part of it had been thrown away only the gaudier portions having been cut into the strips by soldiers to be made into bandoliers. These strips, together with similar ones obtained from natives in the forest, I sent to England to Dr. P. L. Slater for his consideration. Furnished by the Belgian officers with guides and taking with me all the dwarfs whom I had brought from Uganda, I entered the forest and remained there for days searching for the okapi. All this time, I was convinced that I was on the track of a species of horse, and therefore, when the natives showed the tracks of a cloven-footed animal, like the eland, and told us these were the footprints of the okapi, I disbelieved them, and imagined that they were merely following a forest eland. We never saw the okapi, and as the life in the forest made the whole expedition extremely ill, and my time was required for official work elsewhere, I was obliged to give up the search. Meantime, I had elicited from the natives, whom I questioned closely, that the okapi was a creature without horns or any means of offense, the size of a large antelope or mule, which inhabited only the densest parts of the forest, and generally went about in pairs, male and female. It lived chiefly on leaves, the Belgian officers seeing that I was disappointed at not obtaining a complete skin offered to use their best efforts to obtain one for me, and sent it on to Uganda after my departure. This promise was eventually redeemed by Mr. Carl Eriksson, a Swedish officer in the Belgian service. Mr. Eriksson sent me a complete skin and two skulls. The skin and the bigger of the two skulls belong to a young male. This is the skin which is now set up in the Natural History Museum at South Kensington and of which a photograph illustration accompanies this notice. Upon receiving the skin, I saw at once what the okapi was, namely a close relation to the giraffe. From the very small development of the horn bosses, I believed that it was nearer allied to the Helidotherium than to the living giraffe. In forwarding the specimens to Professor Ray Lancaster, I therefore proposed that it should be called Helidotherium tigranum. Professor Ray Lancaster, having examined the specimens with a greater knowledge than I possess, decided that the animal was rather more closely allied to the giraffe than to the Helidotherium, but that it possessed sufficient peculiarities of its own to oblige him to create for its reception a new genus which he proposed to call Ocopia. Meantime, the original strips of the skin which apparently belonged to an older and larger animal than the specimen mounted at South Kensington, had been pronounced by experts to whom they were submitted to be the skin of an undiscovered species of a horse, and this supposed new horse had been tentatively named by Dr. P. L. Sclater, Equus Johnstoni. The full discovery obliged Professor Ray Lancaster to set aside any idea of the okapi being allied to the horse, but he was good enough to attach Mr. Sclater's specific name of Jostini to his newly founded genus of Okapia. Up to the time of this writing, this is all that is known of this extraordinary survival in the Congo forest of the only living relation of the giraffe. We know by the paleontological discoveries in Europe and in Asia that there existed a large family of ruminants which in their development and features were neither of the ox group nor of the deer, but in some respects occupied a position midway between 
these two branches of cloven hoof horned ruminating ungulates. To this family, the giraffe, the okapi, the halodotherium, the samotherium, the civotherium, and the bramotherium belong. In all probability, bony projections arose from the skulls of these creatures similar in some measure to the prominent bony cores of the horns of oxen. From the top, however, of these bony cores, there would have seemed to have arisen anciently antlers, possibly deciduous like those of the prongbuck. In time, creatures like the giraffe lost any need for such weapons of offense and ceased to grow antlers, but the bony cores from which these antlers once proceeded still remained, and in the case of the giraffe, remain to the present day. In the Helodotherium and in the Okapi, these bony cores have dwindled to mere bumps. End of section 49. Recording by Jackie Graves, Noblesville, Indiana.